And so when we went to see Ed, I mean, it was it was one of the most significant. And I'm going to tell you, this shouldn't be. <laughs> no one's going to get Ed Milet's time at this, <laughs> you know, at this <laughs> level, right? But um, but you, um, I went to see Ed and just we had a great conversation. But he, but but it was very very short. He's extremely busy, and he looked at me and he said, he goes, Coleman, you are a million dollar guy. He goes. Everyone knows it yeah. except for you. Yeah. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, what? And I started thinking to myself, I am a million dollar guy. That like that's unbelievable. And you know what was crazy is that Ed just in that moment, what he did is he reminded me who I really was. So today I am so excited. I am here with one of my favorite people on planet Earth. Michael Coleman is, is just a tremendous leader. So the great Michael Coleman, we've been in business together how many years now? Uh, 16 years. 16 years. And you guys, I've mentored tens of thousands of people and he's the only one that I've said, if we could do cloning, I would clone Michael Coleman. So Michael is just phenomenal. And you know, I want to focus on a few things. First of all, he's a seven figure earner. He is an incredible husband and probably one of the most caring leaders and mentors that I've ever met. And I remember when you came into our business mm -hmm. and uh, so just maybe just kind of share a little bit about your background first, where, where you came from and kind of that transition into becoming an entrepreneur. Well, I, my background is pretty varied, you know. Um, I wasn't born in the mainland U.S. I was born in a little tiny island called Guam and then wound up going to moving to Seattle. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of like interesting things happen to me, like where just growing up, success was always around me, but I didn't realize it until much later. Like my mom used to take us to the original Starbucks when there was one Starbucks in Seattle. Really? Yeah. And, <laughs> uh, and then she was like, oh yeah, I tell that story sometimes. She goes, yeah, I also took you to the original Mrs. Fields. You know, and then she was canvassing for jobs and decided not to go into Microsoft in 1983. Oh, no. Give me so, chills. Yeah. <laughs> so then I went, you know, I graduated from high school and went to college in Boston. I studied music. So my background is in music, jazz guitar, music production. That's why you're so fun. Yeah. And creative. I try. I try. And awesome at everything. <laughs> and then I went into uh, IT while I was playing music in LA. And then um, I wound up getting transferred to marketing. And that was kind of a you know, springboard. And then I managed to retire, uh, you know, while I was in college, I also was like a school teacher. I helped out with little kids. And then I went to, um, uh, I retired in the end, end of the nineties. And, uh, I just, I was working on a farm and I was super happy, you know, and that was one of the t best times of my life was this two year stint of living in New Hampshire to just really kind of find peace. And I realized I didn't need to kind of like rush around in the, you know, and, and that was always something after that point, I got recruited by a big tech company in Florida. And I always was like, man, I, I gave up that piece to go after, go back into the job market. So then I wound up going there and our company went out of business. And then I got recruited by a big advertising company in, in LA. And then that's when, um, you know, I realized that I was other end of the spectrum. I was the most stressed out I had ever been in my life. And so then one of my, um, you know, one of my friends invited me down to, uh, you know, to meet with you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and when we had first met, I just suddenly realized I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, like being in business, I needed to have something that had an unlimited capabilities. Like I just hated being in jobs where I was always capped out because mm -hmm. everything, every job that I'd ever do, I would hit the lid real fast. And then I go, well, what's next? What's where can I go? Right. You know, and then this was the one thing, you know, that when we started talking, I was like, look, can you just tell me it, that there's no lid that as big as I can think that you're going to let me run? And you said, yes. And I said, OK, then I'm in. I remember that day. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, tens of thousands of people, you know, that we've mentored and coached and kind of got off to a start and stuff. But I just remember you coming in and one word I would say about you is, you know, vision. Mm. And even as this employee making this transition, you ask these questions. Could I have offices and teams and impact people in all these different states? And even, in, you know, I want to be in these different countries. And so right off the bat, you know, constantly 
having this big vision and big hope. And when you said, you know, being happy, yeah. I think no matter where they put you, you would be happy. Yes. That you're just find a way to be happy and bring happiness yeah. to others. So, you know, as you were getting started, I mean, was it just easy all the time or <laughs> you know, were there challenges you had to overcome? You know, I think that um, it, it, it was easy for me because I would never focus on the things that were difficult. I, I never, to me, I was all part of the growth. You know, I felt like any rejection, I was just like, okay, good, bring on the next one. You know, it's like, that's- Yes, that's one thing I always was wondering about you. Like, you know, as you're coaching entrepreneurs, they're sometimes in, you know, coming to your house crying, yeah. oh, I'm gonna do this, you know, with all of the stuff that's hitting them. And it could be little or big, but with you, you know, I'm sure that you're going through, and you, I know that you've gone through some tough things, and, yeah. you know, with your wife, you've gone through some um, hard things that have happened to your family, sure, sure. and uh, death in the family even, and um, yet you, you always put the positive on everything, and you always look at the bright side, and you always focus on what's good and what's cool. next. Yeah. How do you do that? You know, for me, um, I feel that when we first got together and started working together, I started, I, I realized that I had this, this moment of clarity. And, uh, you know, sometimes I, I, you know, it's like that, that moment in Jerry Maguire where he's doing his, uh, you know, his, his mission statement or whatever. And I was writing up my first sort of business plan and I realized that it was really, it was really the blueprint for the life that I wanted. From start to finish, I blueprinted exactly what I wanted my life to look like. It's and like you got clarity on that vision. Yes. I mean, it totally, I it completely got clarity. And you know what happened is that I, I got a tremendous amount of peace because what happened is that as soon as I put that plan, you know, it's like um, Napoleon Hill talks about that, you know, in, in any great endeavor, we must have, uh, you know, uh, plans that are faultless. When I looked at my plan, I knew there was going to be work and there was going to be challenge, but the 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 plan itself was faultless. So I knew that if I could just keep returning back to the blueprint, that I would be able to overcome any challenges that I had, and that was so exciting to me. I was like, so anytime that I'd be you know feel a little bit beat up or anything like that, I would go, okay, good, but but I'm on my plan, mm -hmm. and every day you know I would wake up you know, and review my business plan. I would review my day and I would go, okay. And I would envision the most positive outcome of every interaction that I was going to have every day. Yeah. And before I went and I do this to this day, so every it takes night, discipline. It does. And then it becomes a habit, right? Yeah. It's totally a habit. And so That's then awesome. at night, I always review what I'm going to do the next day mm -hmm. so that when I close my eyes, I am only envisioning positive outcomes for my following day. So, yeah. I'm sure that helps you in marriage and everything, huh? It does, it does. <laughs> wow, well, what were some of the hardest things that you had to deal with? Some of the hardest things, um, let's see here. I think that, uh, you know, when, um, well, when my dad passed away, that was pretty I love your dad. crazy. Oh, my dad's amazing. I and see so much of you, you know, coming from him. He's such a good man. Totally. And he, um, you know, and he was, he was like the real, like, I'll tell you, when I was coming up in the business, he was still working at his job. Mm -hmm. And then he lost his job. And because we were able to build this business together, um, you know, I said, I, I said, I told my dad, I said, you know, you're, you're losing your job. And, and it was so funny because he lost his job. He worked in accounting. He was just an accountant. And then they outsourced his whole department to some place over in Europe. And so he had to train the people that were replacing him. Oh my gosh. And so, and like he, corporate America. oh, corporate, it was just horrible. And so I told him, I said, you know what? Um, when you, when you're done, you know, like you're going to come work for me. And so that was the greatest thing about being in business for myself was that literally the last, you know, probably about three or four years of my dad's life, he worked with me every day. We would be in the office together. We'd go in to lunch every day, yeah. you know? And so I look at the fact that, you know, when we, when we lost him, it was a tremendous loss. But I got to spend four, you know, three or four focused years with him 
that I don't think most people get to spend with their parents. You know, mm -hmm. like I probably spent 20 years of quality time with my dad because I had choices and I had options to be able to have him come work with me. You know, so anyway, so that was that was a pretty significant challenge. And then, you know, I think that one other big challenge in, in, that happened to me was no matter how good you're doing in business, if you feel like a failure, it doesn't matter how everything else is going. I remember that, you know, we were just had a lot of momentum. The organization was doing well. And uh, next thing you know, all of a sudden, everything that I touched in that that I was working on turned to crap. <laughs> like, <laughs> like we've all been there. Like you want that Midas touch, everything turns to gold. Exactly. No, I think it was like the first two years of my business, everything that I touched turned to crap. <laughs> yes. Well, but that was the funny thing is that for me it didn't happen right. in the initially. For me, everything was very successful in my first two years. Yeah, like you just were the best trainee, and then you were the best. Yeah, I just super coachable, yeah, but then- I mean, Sean talks about it. It's like, you know, you ever invite, you know, one person and then five shows up, we yeah. hate that guy. <laughs> and that was me. I yeah. literally would, you know, ask to meet with one person and then they bring five yes. people to but meet But then the with. adversity comes. But it, it, it didn't. Caught up. <laughs> and it was really weird. Cause I was like, wow, this thing's so easy. And you know, and a, a positive mindset probably helped a lot. Yeah. But then I hit this stride where, you know, the team was growing. I was actually making great money. We'd opened up, you know, like multiple leaders were starting to extend. But because I felt like a failure, you know, and everyone that I talked to said no. You know, they'd go, oh, you know what? Hold on one second. I'm just going to go run out to my car real quick, you know, and get my checkbook or whatever. And, uh, and then I'd see them drive away. You know, and I was like, that was so disheartening to me. Or I'd walk to meet with a, a family, you know, and and then the, the 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 lights would turn off as I'm walking up the driveway <laughs> to or something. House. Yeah, to their house. Pretend you they're know? not home. Everybody be quiet. You know? Kids be quiet. And then I'm just like, you gotta be kidding me. And so that happened for two months. So you kind of started to get down on yourself. Yes. And listen to that voice. But it, before, but regardless of the you know uh, the the success because I was making money and the growth, but because I had a lack of belief and I started thinking, wow, there's something wrong with me. So then what happened was that, you know, you were just very clever and uh, in, in, in observing that particular moment. And you're like, oh, you need to go have, you know, you called me up and you're like, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? And I said, I'm busy and I don't want to do anything. And I'm and yeah, but I but I told you I was busy, and I was not busy. I had nothing going on. And then uh, you said um, you said okay, well I'll cancel whatever you're doing. And I was like, that hit me like a ton of bricks because you never told me to cancel meetings or anything. Like you're always like, go to the meeting. There's opportunity around every corner. You know, you're you're uh, you know one step away from gold. You know, diamond acres of diamonds, like all this <laughs> stuff, right? And so when you said cancel everything, you're like clear your schedule, and I was like what are you doing? Like, I'm not going to, you told me never to clear my schedule for anything. And you said, uh, I need you to go have, uh, you know, I just talked to Ed Milet and he wants to have lunch with you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that. um, I don't want to have lunch with Ed. I, <laughs> and I told you, I said, please, can you just, can you call him? And I don't want to talk to him. Can you just cancel? And you're like, I'm not canceling on Ed Milet, you know, like <laughs> knock it off. Right. <laughs> and so, um, the, uh, but what happened is that, you know, you never want to see your mentors and the people that are helping you when you're down. Yeah. You only want to see You want to withdraw. Yeah. And you go, and, and I told you, I said, listen, let me just get my numbers up. Let me just kind of like perform at a higher level and then I'll go see that's Ed. That's when you need to reach out the most. Exactly, the most. Yeah. And so when we went to see Ed, I mean, it was it was one of the most significant, and I'm going to tell you, this shouldn't be that. No one's gonna get Ed Milet's time at this, you know, at this level, right? But um, but you um, I went to see Ed and just we had a great conversation, but he, but but it was very very short. He's extremely busy, and he looked at me and he said, he goes, Coleman, you are a million dollar guy. He goes, everyone knows it yep. except for you, yep. and that hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, what? And I started thinking to myself, I am a million dollar guy. That like that's unbelievable. And you know what was crazy is that Ed just in that moment 
what he did is he reminded me who I really was. You know, and that's what I was leader's like, job. That's what the job of the leader is. Exactly. Because I think in that moment of adversity, I think that we forget how powerful we actually are. And and if you really took a step back and you looked at like when you were a kid, you could do anything. Anything that you dreamed was possible. And when we become adults, somewhere along the way, that muscle atrophies and we don't believe in ourselves anymore. And it was just Ed bringing my attention to the fact that, hey, you're, you are more powerful than you can possibly imagine. I was like, oh yeah, that's, hey, you know what? No big deal. That's why as an entrepreneur or anybody that's trying to, to become better in something, yeah. whether it be sports or in business or whatever, you need a coach and yes. you need leaders and you need people that care about you mm -hmm. around you. You can't do it all, all the time. Yes. And, and then in that moment, like you've always been coachable and you've always been kind of charging, but we all go into slumps. Yes. We all go into certain funks where we, you know, the negativity gets the best of us, or there's just kind of too many distractions yeah. that we take our eye off the ball and, you know, it's got to start to coast. Mm -hmm. And it's good that we'll have someone either challenge us or to shift our paradigm, like what Ed did with you. Yeah. Um, but as you're coaching other people, I want you to, the one thing that he said here was so powerful. As you're coaching other people, you can't be all things to all people all the time too. And so what I did there was I leveraged other leadership yep. and my good friend, Ed Milet, who's amazing and just kind of had Ed have that short little conversation and boom, now one of your guys is, you know, seven figure earner. So, so awesome. Yeah, totally. All right. So. Coleman, what are, yes. if you had like a genie in a bottle and you have three wishes, yes. what would you wish for? What would I wish for? Um, more wishes, obviously. <laughs> if you can't have any more I know, wishes. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I think that's, you know, that goes last thing. You know, I, you know, I think that, um, I, you know, I don't know about three wishes, but I, I guess the, the first thing that comes to mind is that I, w I would wish for um, more common sense in the world. Yeah. I see there's so much strife Seriously. and, and I, I feel, yeah, I feel like that just people are unwilling to listen to each other right now more than ever before. Nonsense, and a lot of nonsense, social tons, media, yeah. Tons, you know, and so I, I, I feel if people took a sort of a golden rule approach mm -hmm. and kind of were reminded like, look, we got to treat others how we want to be treated, mm -hmm. like the world would just be s such a, a more fun place, you know, to be able to see see someone else's perspective like I have people that disagree with me but I can but I'm always you know willing to see see it from their point of view and try and have some understanding before I jump to conclusions about stuff you know what I'm saying yeah. okay. so that would be the the first thing is I just wanted I'd want that there were more common sense in the world I guess you know um I feel like uh I mean I, I feel like a lot of my wishes have come true. <laughs> you know, I don't feel like... You always have gratitude. Yes. That's what I notice about you. You're mm. always in gratitude for everything. When something doesn't go right, you smile. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's just kind of let you let it roll off you. And I want to shift gears because one of the okay. one things I was really excited about talking to you today about is to make this point. You know, they say that, they you know, the good guy doesn't win. Yeah. And, you know... You're competitive mm -hmm. and you are a hard worker and you know, you're a great guy. Thank you. One of the most loyal, one of the most hardworking, one of the most giving, caring people that I've ever met. Um, and you know how they say like you have to be kind of just super competitive at all costs to win. Yeah. And I just, you know, I think you're living proof of the good guy can come in first sure. and the good guy can't, you know what I mean? And so I want you to kind of explain your philosophy there. Yeah, I think that the the way that I look at the world is, um, you know, I, I feel like, I'll give you an example. One of the uh, things that you often hear people say is live like this were your last day on earth. Mm -hmm. And it's one of my least favorite sayings because I feel that if, in all honesty, if this was your last day on earth, you know what people do? It'd be pretty heavy. That? <laughs> That'd be pretty heavy. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> but, but they go, but they usually like, they do stupid things, you know, I'm like, go skydiving. Yeah, I'm skydiving <laughs> or, you know, I'm going to drink until I pass out or I'm going to, you know, like they're going to do like stupid stuff, you know? And to me, 
I, I'm like, okay, well, if it were, if it were my, my last day, I mean, I'd spend it with my family and, you know, I'd spend it with my friends and, you know, and, and that's the way that would be. But to me, as a philosophy, I look at it the other way. Live like you are going to be here forever. Do you understand? It's like if you are going to inherit all of the decisions that you make every single day and you are going to be here forever, then you would have to live with those decisions. And I feel like people make bad decisions because they don't have consequences or they don't see the consequences. So to me, being responsible is like going, okay, well, if I make this decision, if I cut corners or if I conduct myself with a lack of integrity or if I do the wrong things and, I, and we know they're wrong, then what happens is I have to live with that. Mm -hmm. you know. So the, the gratification that we would have, short term, medium or long term, is not worth it if I know that I'm gonna inherit that decision you know, well into yeah. the future and beyond this life. So that's the way I connect myself. I go, okay, good. Like, what would I do that's going to be the absolute right thing from here and for forever? And I and then I never have to think about it again. I never have to have worry. You know, can sleep so. well at night. Yes, absolutely. Clear conscience. Awesome. Sure. Well, I, you know, I used to have this saying. Um, you guys remember there was an old TV show called Everybody Loves Raymond, <laughs> and I would say Everybody Loves Coleman, <laughs> Michael Coleman. And I think that's one of your great strengths in business is that you attract people to you because everybody loves Coleman and that's because of the way you treat others. Mm. So what advice would you give entrepreneurs or leaders that you know obviously are trying to lead thousands and they're in the grind and the day to day and the stresses and just how to treat people right? Yeah, I mean, to me, um, treating people right, I mean, it comes with everything and like, like, you know, I, I kind of sometimes, I see people that are very, you know, well-respected business leaders and they may treat their family well, but then they don't treat their assistants well, yeah. you know, or they, they have, the yes, exactly. <laughs> and they're very multifaceted and, it, it, you know, it's like you, you, someone even say two-faced, yeah, you know? Exactly. And to me, I go, listen, I'm me, man. You know, it's like, I'm gonna treat, and, and I've always treated everyone from like the, you know, from the per person that's the lowest person on the totem pole, all the way up to the people that are running the, you know, the whole show, I've always tried to grant them importance and make them feel like they're important because to me they are, you know, and yeah, um, they're a member of your team. Absolutely, mm -hmm. you know, and so it, I just I feel like it's just um, when when you're when you when you get too big for your britches and you know that ego starts to kick in i mean something is going to cause ego you to be humble yeah mm -hmm. and i feel like you know what if you just treat um your you know yourself with humility you know i always have this thought that people always talk about this concept of of you know high identity and that's always been a really interesting concept to me of right. of people being quote unquote high identity Putting it into like, I'm better than you, or he's better than so-and-so. -so. Yeah, exactly. And I think that um, for me, I go, look, there's nobody that's high identity. I mean, it's like everybody, but what it is, is that if we were really to define that, high identity means that this person excels in an area in which I don't excel in yet. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I give this funny example of, you know, if, if, um, if, uh, if Bill Gates, you know, had a little bit of a stomach bug, you know, and we all know what that can cause, right? And you came in and you had the emodium. Well, now all of a sudden you're a high identity guy to Bill Gates, you know, because you have the thing that he's looking for, right? But uh, it's, uh, I, just, I, I look at it and I go, look, we all have our strengths, yes. you know, and if we remember that, you know, this person may excel in, in monetary or material ways, but you may excel in spiritual or family ways. It's like you don't forget your gifts, right. you know? And so if you remember what your gifts are, then you, then you can know that you are a high identity person in yes. these facets, you know? And I think in, in, you know, in today's world of social media and just the inundation of the amounts of information and the things that we see, yeah. We lose track of the fact of our own strengths. Yeah. So when I see people, Comparing and yes, exactly. When I see people, I see them as as people, 
you know, as that whatever, whoever this high identity person is, they're, they are struggling with things too, because what do people want? They want an improvement, you know? And so if you look at the biggest, you know, wealthiest people that we're taught to look up to in society, and you were to sit down with somebody like that, and you were to ask them, well, what, what, what's on your mind? You know, how do you want the world to be better? Or what, you, they would tell you, and then you go, oh, wow, okay, I can do yeah, that. Yeah, and you can learn from them. I believe that you can learn from everybody. Yes. And to be open. Mm -hmm. And you can even learn from people that are doing it wrong. Yeah. Or, you know I mean, what not to do. Sure. Um, but I think that is one of your gifts to treat people right yeah. and to I think one of the basic human needs is th to feel like they belong yeah and that they're included and that they're heard and so that again I think that's one of the one of the reasons what do you think is the secret to your success one of the majors that got you to where you're at <sighs> majors um let me think about that gosh that's such a deep question <laughs> I you know I guess the first thing that comes to mind is just um you know um, a dogged determination you know, and perspective. Um, whenever Longer perspective, that's what you mean, or yeah, well, just not to get so mired down in the in like if I, if I have a particular challenge or something that um, you know is beating me up now after like 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 that conversation with Ed that's kept my sales filled for the last decade. The one one sentence conversation with yeah. someone that believes in You're like you. Three feet from gold. You just gotta get there. Yeah. yeah, like that one thing that he says. You know, you're a million dollar guy, and everyone knows it, but you. I was just like, okay, that that is. Every time I think about it, it's like, you know what? I am bigger. I'm more powerful. But as far as like, you know, the um, having that that positive attitude, I always keep it in perspective. I always go, you know what? Um, it's, it's it's never as, as bad as you think it is, right. and it's never as good as you think yeah, it is. Never too high, never, never too, too low. low. Exactly, and I'm just like, keep you know. Even keeled and just keep at it. Yes, exactly. And you know, and I also just my ability to um, persist in a given direction, I just, I will, if I have put my mind to doing something, then I will not stop until I get it done. But that means that every day I wake up and I go, did I take a step closer to that goal? And if I do, I go, okay, today was a win. If I wake up and, and or I, I go to sleep at the end of the day and I go, did I get closer to that goal? No, it was filled with distraction. Then I go, what am I gonna change tomorrow that's gonna move me closer to the goal? So every day I'm either moving towards the goal or course correcting, I know my goals are gonna come true. You know, and so that's what I mean by perspective is I don't get so mired down in looking at the problem that I lose sight of where I'm going long term. Right. Well, one last question. Sure. What is your favorite part or favorite thing about being an entrepreneur? My favorite part of being an entrepreneur is the ability to have choice. I think that, you know, for Heather and I, we look out at what we've been able to do and the fact that, you know, we are in control. And, and by the way, you know, that doesn't mean that we've made everything happen that we want to have happen, <laughs> but we've had a chance to experience um, uh, a level of control in our lives that I think um, people pine for, that they wish that they had. You know, having to go to a job and answer to someone else um, having to, you know, do things uh, or like have lack in your life because you don't have options. Um, that's just a life that I realized I never wanted. And so being able to have options or choice and freedom, but not just with money, but also with time, um, that's my favorite part of being an entrepreneur is the control, you know. Awesome. One of my favorite parts is getting to know just amazing people like you. When we met, you were young and yes. single, you know, and I've been able to watch you grow into this amazing leader that you've become. So you guys, this is living proof that, you know, you can be mentally tough, you can be a hard worker, you can go after your biggest goals and biggest dreams and grind and work hard all the time and be loving and kind and generous and giving and philanthropic and just a great, great guy and good to others.